Wow, after that uh, opening, I feel hardly worthy to be up here opening the or giving the first lecture of this meeting, but I shall do my best to not disappoint. It's great to be back in San Francisco, and I really appreciate the opportunity, Manny, and the committee for uh, selecting me to start off your meeting here. And I'm going to start up first of all, oh, <coughs> pardon me, wasn't, thought it was going to be okay. I wasn't going to apologize for the fact I'm getting over a cold, and so my, my voice uh, is affected, but also my hearing from being on the plane last night. I'm, I mean, I can't even hear. So the, uh, sorry if I can't tell the feedback from the audio. Just someone give me a sign up or down if I'm popping the microphone, being too loud or not talking loud enough. And what I will talk about then is uh, vasopressor choices for treating spinal hypotension. I have no disclosures to make. So this, uh, for all of us who practice OB anesthesia, it's a very familiar issue. It affects us, uh, some of us con consider it much more important than others. I know uh, Jake Balin, who I don't think is here, I haven't seen him, but uh, I'll, I'll uh, go ahead and quote him a couple of times during this lecture. To him, it's uh, at least in, in one editorial, it's, it's a disturbing but not dangerous thing. Uh, the incidence of major complications from hypotension uh, or is almost uh, non-existent. <clears throat> Others, however, have called this the holy grail of obstetric anesthesia, or at least the prevention of hypotension to be the holy grail of obstetric anesthesia. And still others have pointed to some of the really, really bad problems that can occur, at least with untreated hypotension. I think in this uh, modern era of obstetric anesthesia, we've moved past maternal deaths as being a, a potential issue with spinal hypotension, but certainly acidosis, low APGAR scores, the, the neonatal effects are things that we'll talk about during this lecture, and of course, uh, interference with the surgical procedure. There's a, you know, a longer list than this, but uh, reasons to try to avoid this. I think we can all pretty much agree in our modern practice, though, we're just trying to avoid, for the most part, maternal nausea, and uh, that is a lot of what this lecture will focus on. So others have called it, I didn't have a reference here, I don't know who to credit this with, I didn't come up with it, but we call this a, the, one of these big, big little problems. I like that way of looking at it. Okay, so here's, uh, first of all, a little history. Yes, the uh, photo of Roman ruins is the universal sign for a history lesson is coming. Um, and this is a picture of our uh, obstetric anesthesia library and conference room, which as you can see, sometimes also doubles as our simulator lab there, and uh, also where someone in the corner is doing charting on, on a patient, so our multifunction room. But on the back wall there, you see these things for the younger members of our audience. Those are called books. These are uh, paper, information written on paper or, t or uh, printed on paper and bound into a uh, cover. And right there in the center is a uh, really famous one. I know that you're all familiar with the uh, e-copy of this, but the uh, uh, Chestnut's textbook of obstetric anesthesia. And in preparing for this lecture, I already had the idea to uh, start with this as a, you know, as a sort of a historical perspective on teaching hypotension. And I went and found that book, photographed it, pulled it out, but actually was a little surprised sorry, the uh, slide advanced to, to notice that this is my uh, fellowship copy. I forgot to even know where that thing had ended up. So this was, uh, this particular one is from 1994. And uh, so it is the one that I had during, during my fellowship. I held close to my side uh, at pretty much at all times. It was the uh, or one of the Bibles of obstetric anesthesia. And in that book, on page 284, it says some vasoactive drugs such as phenylephrine and high-dose dopamine ideally are avoided in the pregnant patient. And that ephedrine is the preferred vasopressor for prophylaxis or treatment in most cases of hypotension in this setting. So here's how I, this is how I was taught, and I see some heads nodding out there. There are some people that uh, are, are um, I'd say, uh, my, my, uh, my vintage of training, so to speak. And uh, so this is how dogmatically we were trained. You did not use, you simply did not use phenylephrine. Ephedrine was the drug of choice. Now this is 2001, this is UK practice, not the US, but I think it reflected US practice around that time. Even in 2001, still pretty much ephedrine was uh, the vasopressor of choice. A few other things being used, but you can see phenylephrine there, way under 1%. Back to Jake Balin, and in that editorial, to be fair to him, he's 
responding to one publication that was uh, in the uh, anesthesiology literature in 2006, but he said even in 2006 that he contends using a phenylephrine infusion to prevent hypotension during routine cesarean delivery is too aggressive and not safe. And he titled it, The Treatment Should Not Be Worse Than the Disease. So why is it that phenylephrine was uh, so blacklisted during this time? Uh, yeah, I, could, I could talk for a long time on this and won't. Uh, one of the studies, though, in sheep was, as you can see, the first author there on, on that list of references is Frank James, who uh, was the chair when I started at Wake Forest and gave me my first real job. Before that time, though, he was doing studies on sheep looking at uh, pregnant ewes and the effect of vasopressors on uterine center perfusion and, uh, and the effects on the, the uh, lambs. And what they showed consistently, he and other, uh, other researchers as well, that there were poor outcomes with using direct alpha agonists. Uh, they, this was blamed on vasoconstriction and uh, the, uh, of the uteroplacental circulation, and so it distressed these fetuses and even killed them. And so we extrapolated that to human practice and said that you just should not use these alpha agonists. You should use a, <coughs> a, a mixed beta agonist. Again, I could talk about this. I could spend 20 minutes talking about these studies. A lot of it is very interesting in the things they found. But I think I can sum it all up simply by saying that sheep are not people. That is the bottom line. There was things were going on certainly with uh, the, the, the sheep physiology that, that apparently do not occur in humans. Even as late as 2009, Rich Smiley uh, published this editorial that he titled Burden of Proof. And this was in response to one of Warwick Nanke's uh, infusion articles, phenylephrine infusion articles, where he lamented that still to this day, or to the day in 2009, that phenylephrine was really not taking hold in, in routine practice in the United States. And he listed a few potential reasons that could be. One is that the burden of proof is on this new therapy, as, as is the title of his article. The, when you come up with something this new and, and, and fairly radical at the time in terms of how it, it looked in, in sheep and how we had dogmatically practiced for so long, you really, really have to have a, a, uh, a high level of proof to know that this new therapy is something that we should all adopt immediately. The other thing is that at the time, and, and you guys, and even to this day, I think we can argue this, is we're not talking about life or death here. We're, we're basically trying to prevent um, maternal nausea. And again, we'll talk about the fetal state here in a minute, but, but that, that's, that's part of it. But most of it is just we're trying to prevent women from feeling bad. It's not life or death, and ephedrine works okay. Certainly setting up an infusion and, and doing all this takes a little bit more effort. And also, and this is true still to this day to some degree as well, the, the evidence is mostly just in healthy patients. So what about patients who are already, uh, who are, are preeclamptic and already have hypertension or other hypertensive disorders and, and uh, other patients with, with heart disease and things that we're going to hear about later. So I'll move on to the discussion of this big little problem with that history lesson and tell you that there are dozens, perhaps even hundreds of references that I could have used to, to make this lecture. And anyone who gives this lecture could give a different version of it and send a, a slightly different message, although the, I think the final message is going to be the same, or at least a, a lot of different ways of getting there, but I think that the final message is going to be the same. There's uh, what it looks like if you search cesarean hypotension vasopressor as keywords in PubMed, you'll get 322 articles. So I've already mentioned Warwick Nanke's name. He is an obstetric anesthesiologist uh, who's a New Zealander, but now in Hong Kong. And he, I know, I know a lot of you know him, a lot of you are familiar with him, even if you don't know him. He has published arguably the uh, lion's share, certainly the most important articles that have been published on this subject um, in the obstetric anesthesia literature. And he has helped me a lot in the preparation for this lecture, and so has, I've already mentioned the name Rich Smiley as well. There he is hanging out with his least favorite uh, ex-president, and uh, only picture I had of him, sorry. So he also has helped me a lot as well on this. And in fact, this is um, my opportunity to publicly thank uh, both of them for their contributions to this. And in fact, I uh, suspect the only reason neither of them are giving this lecture and that I am is because they weren't available. But thanks, Manny, for, uh, for letting me do it anyway. 
All right, so really having trouble with the answer. There we go. So the um, phenylephrine studies we're going to look at, I'm going to start early with one. Surprisingly, 1988, we were already looking, or someone was already looking at this. Uh, 137 elective cesarean deliveries in this one, comparing 5 milligram ephedrine increments or phenylephrine uh, 100 microgram increments in boluses. And they looked at both maternal and neonatal outcomes, maternal in terms of uh, using impedance cardi uh, cardiography, maternal ejection fraction, stroke volume, and diastolic volume. And with the baby, the usual things that we look at, uh, umbilical arterial pH and, uh, well, the blood gas, basically, the whole thing, plus a few extra things we don't often uh, always look for. And what they found was that both ephedrine and phenylephrine increased cardiac preload, that the, uh, the, even if you had transient maternal hyper, hypotension, it did not affect the, the fetal acid base status. And phenylephrine, contrary to popular belief at that time, remember, this is 1988, did act, actually did not cause any problems with the fetus, did not cause acidosis or any other problems. So fortunately, in 2002, uh, there was a meta-analysis published by Warwick Nanke and, and uh, co-authors, and a couple of his articles are actually included in here, so I don't have to actually go through those one at a time. They can be summarized in this 2002 uh, uh, meta-analysis. And of course, we looked at the, they looked at the usual things, maternal hypotension, uh, maternal hypertension, and bradycardia, and, and uh, neonatal status. And found, again, this meta-analysis of seven randomized control trials, there is no difference between phenylephrine and ephedrine in terms of the amount of maternal hypotension, maternal hypertension, or neonatal APGAR scores. However, very importantly, maternal bradycardia is worse with phenylephrine. And those of you who use it now routinely know that that's a problem. And that there are lower umbilical arterial pH uh, levels with the use of, solely with the use of ephedrine when you compare it to the use with, uh, of, of phenylephrine. Now, notice this doesn't say fetal acidosis. That definition, most uh, papers will define it as 7-2. And true fetal acidosis was not different in, in uh, either group. But overall pH is lower when you use ephedrine. <clears throat> Here's the forest plot from that uh, meta-analysis showing, that in this case, it's the uh, umbilical arterial pH clearly favoring phenylephrine. Now, whenever there is a reference in red, as on this slide, it means that it's a new one that I've added that's not in the syllabus. So if um, you're one of those who likes to jot them down when you see a red one, this is one. There are only two or three that I've added on here, but I uh, just wanted to let you know about that. I went ahead and added this in. Even though it, it basically says the same thing, it's, I think it's important to mention because it is 10 years later, another meta-analysis meta with that there were enough papers published in that 10-year interval to do this again, but it shows the same thing. Uh, this is the forest plot with the uh, fetal acidosis, again, uh, clearly favoring phenylephrine. And I didn't show bradycardia. It looks the same on the 2002 meta-analysis, but same thing here. Uh, maternal bradycardia clearly favors uh, ephedrine. There's what uh, phenylephrine looks like if, uh, or Warwick Nanke drew it anyway, if you make a drawing of it. At the end, we'll, uh, you can, I'll show you all three of the molecules we're talking about, and it's interesting how uh, very similar they are. It's also interesting what the small difference is between the three. Okay, but now that we know that phenylephrine is our vasopressor of choice, how do we best use it? Basically, the two ways are bolus or infusion. Uh, bolus is simpler, at least uh, overall. Some would argue infusion is simpler because you don't have to do as much, but you do have to do a lot to get to that point. You have to have a system in place where you can uh, either have pharmacy mixture drugs or you do it yourself. You have to have the administration set up, the uh, infusion pump, and so forth. But let's look at uh, how we use these two. Now, for bolusing, first of all, prior to 2008, there were several articles that, that had just random suggestions of dosing and, and, you know, like here's what we use kind of things, but no dose response study until 2009. And this one looked at uh, uh, one of the methods we use for ED95 determination of phenylephrine. They looked at 50 cesarean deliveries. All of them had a uh, spinal anesthetic, as you can see, they're fairly typical doses for spinal anesthesia. 
And they did this double-blind uh, up-down sequential allocation uh, method, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. I'll show you a plot of that here in a minute if you're not. Starting at 40 micrograms and giving dose increments of 10 mics. The first dose was given immediately after the spinal was placed and then subsequent doses if the systolic blood pressure was anything less than baseline. So here graphically is what that looks like. Open boxes are doses that were ineffective. The closed boxes, doses that were effective. So you have an ineffective dose. You go to the next higher and the next higher until you're effective. Then you go down. Then you go up until you oscillate around a uh, effective dose. And in this case, it was 120 was the highest that uh, was given. However, when you plot ED95, because of the shape of the curve, it's going to be higher than that dose. And in this case, they calculated it, as you can see there, or I put here, as 159 micrograms. And again, they never gave that high of a dose, but that was at least a calculated ED95. Now, here's another red. I added this one in. It's a completely different methodology that I won't go through, and this is an ED90, but I just put it there to show you that another study showed pretty much the same thing, if you look at an ED90 anyway, about 100 micrograms. This study looked at it based on weight. So if you do a weight-based, uh, do this, a similar study, but do it weight-based, this is, um, actually it wasn't, I'm sorry, this isn't up-down sequential allocation, but anyway, looking at it as a weight-based thing. 184 elective cesarean deliveries. They placed a CSE in the lateral position with a low-dose spinal. Uh, I, I don't know how much effect that, it probably does have some effect on how much vasopressor you're going to use, but anyway, for what it's worth, they randomly allocated them to a control, uh, one microgram per kilo boluses, uh, one and a half, and two microgram per kilo boluses. And in each of these cases, the first dose was given at the time of spinal injection. Rescue doses were 100 micrograms given every minute. So what they found was that the one and a half and two mic per kilo doses reduced the incidence of hypotension, but one mic per kilo did not. So in this case, it looks like a little bit higher than what we looked at before, but still in, in a similar range, of course, depending on the weight of your patients. So with infusion dosing, you know, I gave this a lot of thought as to how to best present the, uh, uh, the, the data on this. Um, there are at least 75 studies. Again, here's another look at what PubMed will give you. And it's really hard to go all through this. And no real dose ranging studies were done. Warwick kind of did it early on, started with variable rate infusions, and came around sort of the numbers that we now use that I'll summarize at the end of this, um, at the end of this section, instead of just going into all of those studies. So what I'll do next first, then, is look at bolus versus infusion. So this is an area for a lot of people sort of a source of controversy and uh, interesting for me because I've kind of gone uh, back and forth. And, and if anyone cares about uh, you know, that or you can share your experiences during the panel, hopefully we'll have time to talk about that. In this uh, study, there are two that I know of, two good studies that have compared the two. In this one, they looked at 60 cesarean deliveries, placing a spinal anesthetic, again, fairly uh, typical doses for a spinal. It was double-blinded and randomized, and patients either received 120 microgram intermittent boluses or 120 microgram per minute infusion. They looked at uh, cardiac output uh, in the mother, uh, other routine maternal vital signs, of course, uh, maternal side effects, and the neonatal outcomes. This is the graphic representation of their data, which I show you. I don't think you can really interpret that from where you're sitting, but they did put so much trouble into this and it's so pretty that I had to, uh, had to show it to you. But I can show it to you also in words and that there was no difference in maternal cardiac output, maternal symptoms, or neonatal outcomes, whether you used bolusing or whether you used an infusion. They did show a difference, though, in early maternal hypotension just in the infusion group. So, and I didn't even put in that the second reference, uh, and I can share it with you later if you guys want. Basically the same thing, a totally different study design looking at bolus versus infusion, and they also found almost no differences. Only difference they had was more maternal nausea in the bolus versus the infusion group, but also not a huge difference. So in both of those studies, no, no huge differences between the two. Whenever reading any of these studies, though, it, it always comes to mind for me, and we always need to keep in mind, the difference between how these studies are designed and how we actually practice. And I'll talk about this again more in the summary slide, but 
it's, it's really hard. You don't, I mean, all of you who do obstetric anesthesia, you know how this works. You inject a spinal, a patient, some of them have slow onset of blocks, and they may already be a little bit hypertensive because they're nervous, and so you're holding off a little bit on giving phenylephrine. Some of them start with a systolic blood pressure of 105, and as soon as they lay down, they say, whoa, man, I'm really getting numb, and even maybe start feeling a little bit of dyspnea. You immediately give vasopressor. You're not waiting for that one-minute non-invasive blood pressure to cycle to make an algorithmic decision whether to give 120 mics or not. So that's the way studies are designed, and so that's why it's a little bit hard, in, in my mind at least, to reconcile this as uh, how we should you know, use them to, to formulate our own practice. So as promised, here is the uh, infusion uh, recommendation from uh, Columbia. Rich Smiley uh, has uh, shared this with me. And I think it's a good place to start. Uh, they start with 50. Warwick uh, starts a little bit higher than that, but start an infusion immediately after spinal injection if you're going to use an infusion somewhere in the 50 to 100 microgram range. And this is in your syllabus, so uh, you guys can look through this as well. It talks also about rescue dosing and uh, treatment of maternal bradycardia. I personally prefer to use ephedrine. Uh, they use glycopyrrolate, and I think that's fine. One more thing, another red reference. I uh, wanted to go ahead and throw this in there uh, for, uh, for Warwick's sake, because he, he likes using computer, uh, computer uh, uh, control modules, and, and he's done some literature on this. And I think it's really cool. But if you, this is really taking it to the next level, but it's something to just look at, and, and it's out there, computer control versus mental control of an infusion. Now, certainly, he always uses an infusion no matter what, but whether it's computer control or, or manual. This one uh, starts at 100 mics. The, uh, the algorithm, now again, looks at Q one minute non-invasive pressures to change the uh, algorithm. So each time the computer, it's a closed loop system where the computer takes the blood pressure and changes the phenylephrine infusion based on what that blood pressure was. And what he found when he compared it to manual infusions, it, at least the outcome he looked at, was how, what percentage of women were kept within 20% of baseline. With the computer, it's 97%. Manual control, it's 95%. It reached statistical significance. I'll let you guys decide whether or not uh, 95 is good enough compared to 97 in order to go to try to pursue uh, closed loop computer control infusions. Maybe someday we'll get there. And bolus dosing recommendations, again, looking at calculated ED95 of 159 or ED90 of 100. Uh, I, I start with an 80 to 100 microgram dose, but use common sense. And again, we've touched on this a little bit, but if the mother is having symptoms and getting worse, not better, it's okay to give more drug, especially when the heart rate is really high and the blood pressure cycling twice, and you know it's because the, her blood pressure has dropped precipitously. Um, be proactive, not reactive, I think is the way to, to do this. The studies are, are mostly are all reactive. We need to be proactive when we're giving these drugs and uh, to, have, to have better outcomes. I use ephedrine again when needed, uh, and of course we modify all of this for different disease states. There's only one study I know of looking at it in hypertensive states, and that's retrospective, and I didn't even include it here. So I'm going to spend the remaining five minutes we have here uh, talking about norepinephrine. And some of you uh, might be familiar already with what little bit of literature is out there. Hopefully, at least a handful of you are raising your eyebrows as the uh, collective uh, obstetric anesthesia community did when Warwick first suggested that we'd be using levofed infusions for uh, spinal hypotension. Um, if you guys, I know some of you trained in the era I did, we said levofed leaves them dead in the times that we spent in the ICU using levofed. But of course, that's under completely different circumstances. Primarily, we're using that in uh, various shock states, especially septic shock. And this is something different. So it's fair to raise your eyebrows, but let's, uh, let's give this a chance. So Warwick published the first one, 2015, 104 elective cesarean deliveries with a typical spinal anesthetic. And he randomized them to uh, either an infusion of norepinephrine or an infusion of phenylephrine. And uh, he did look at uh, various uh, sources and did some of his own work to try to make equipotent infusions out of this. And that's what he came up with, five micrograms for uh, uh, norepinephrine, 100 for phenylephrine. And of course, these infusions are computer controlled because it's Warwick. He found that both of them were effective for maintaining maternal blood pressure. However, norepinephrine uh, maintained maternal cardiac output better, and 
uh, prevented that bradycardia, maintained a better uh, maternal heart rate. And in his words, direct quote from him, it's like phenylephrine without the bradycardia. So that article in 2015 uh, was accompanied by an editorial by two other experts in the field who I haven't mentioned yet, Brendan Carvalho. He's one of the uh, guys on the, the committee at this meeting. I'm sure he's, if not in the audience right now, he is here. And Rob Dyer is from South Africa. They also have a great interest in this topic and have published a lot of their own stuff on it as well. In their editorial, they, accompanying Warwick's first article on, on levofed for spinal hypotension, as you can see, they subtitled it, another, the question, another paradigm shift. The answer they gave is no, certainly at least not right now. We are nowhere near the point where we are ready to say that norepinephrine is the new phenylephrine. Certainly a lot of, as I've shown you, there are, there are things that, uh, that cause phenylephrine to be superior to ephedrine. It's not so clear with norepinephrine. We're talking basically about maternal bradycardia and the cardiac output, which, by the way, in most of the studies, pretty much all of the studies, when you give phenylephrine, and we talk about re reducing uh, maternal cardiac output, we're talking about bringing it back down to baseline because it increases after the uh, spinal block. So there's really no known clinical significance to what we see as that difference in cardiac output anyway. Now, Manny Vallejo, our uh, host and, and uh, uh, the guy who introduced me here, did his own study, or actually it's not, it's not published yet, is it, Manny? It's, uh, it's, in, it's, uh, it's going to be published, yeah. It's, it's in, it's in e I knew I could present this, though, because it is, it's been peer-reviewed and it is in, uh, it's, it's available electronically. Even though it hasn't been actually printed, it is peer-reviewed and, and is ready to publish. So this is 85 cesarean deliveries. They all had a spinal anesthetic, as you can see, again, fairly typical doses. They were randomized to either phenylephrine infusion or norepinephrine infusion. And uh, these were in, uh, fixed rate infusions with uh, rescues, unlike Warwick's computer control. Now, Manny found no difference in maternal hemodynamics, no difference in the amount of rescue doses needed, and no difference in neonatal outcomes. However, what he did find, more ephedrine used in the phenylephrine group and more emesis in the phenylephrine group. So similar to what Warwick is saying, um, better overall maintenance of maternal hemodynamics and uh, less problems with the bradycardia and side effects. Now, this provoked, I should say, I think is a fair way to say it, an editorial from Rich Smiley which he titled uh, More Perfect. Uh, the question is, is this uh, more perfect? And is that what we're trying to seek? His uh, answer, similar to the paradigm shift by Carvalho and uh, Dyer, is no. I don't think this is more perfect. Rich spent a lot of time talking about study design and so forth, which I won't get into. But what he does uh, state, I think things that are relevant to us and for us to consider moving forward, is that we need to be careful not to try to make perfect, uh, to get to where perfect is the enemy of good. We're in a pretty good place right now. If you are appropriately using phenylephrine and uh, a combination of ephedrine, you're doing, you're doing really, really well. Uh, do we need to really push this to where we're giving levofed to try to make things even more perfect? At this point, I'd say no, data are still too limited. Uh, as I've already alluded to, the significance of that cardiac output difference isn't even known, and it's probably not a significant uh, difference. And then there's the issue of extravasation. And there are, at Columbia at least, and a lot of other places I've talked to, they actually have policy against giving norepinephrine through a peripheral IV. Warwick counters, however, that the, with these very, very uh, dilute um, concentrations that we're using, that it is simply not an issue, and in fact, it's equipotent to phenylephrine. The reason for not giving uh, norepinephrine through anything but a central line is because of the ICU setting in which it is given at higher doses and higher concentrations. So, We'll see how that turns out, but again, in Warwick's mind, he's, and in fact, he shared with me, I can't share this because it's not under peer review or published, but uh, he's about to publish uh, his one-year experience on norepinephrine, where he has had no problems at all. Okay, so there are, again, the three compounds that we've talked about, their molecular structures uh, as provided by Warwick, ephedrine, phenylephrine, norepinephrine. And as you can see, interestingly, as we add, it seems like we're just getting better and better as we add a hydroxyl group to that uh, aromatic ring. All right, so in summary, phenylephrine is definitely in, although maternal bradycardia still remains uh, somewhat of a problem there, but we can treat it. 
Ephedrine is out, as, and I say only as a, as a primary agent, ephedrine is out. Certainly doesn't mean uh, that you shouldn't have ephedrine in your uh, toolbox, and certainly I, I use it routinely. Again, others use uh, an anticholinergic for the bradycardia, but I think ephedrine is a good choice. Phenylephrine infusions are definitely in. Uh, bolusing is not out, and in fact, uh, again, if we want, to, if anyone's interested, we can talk more on the panel or afterwards. As an aside, I'll talk to you forever about uh, my opinions on bolusing versus infusions, but either is fine. The, the the data will back you up for either one. I think your work environment has a lot to do with with which one is going to be better for you. And as far as norepinephrine goes, it might have a future, but uh, I, I wouldn't, I'm, I'm not going to be the one to advocate to you to rush out and start using it right now. Uh, Manny might want to talk more about that at the panel. Warwick would certainly have you uh, using it right now. That's all I have. Thank you.